Hey everybody, my name is Amanda Cook and I'm a PhD candidate here at the Dunlap Institute and I work on fast radio bursts. We don't know what an FRB is, but they're very easy to define observationally. You just have to look to the name, fast radio burst. Fast meaning the signal only lasts a millisecond or two. Radio because that's the band of frequencies that we're detecting them in. And burst because they are transient signals that are very, very bright. These bursts have a very characteristic profile. The high frequencies arrive before the low frequencies. And that's because they're running into a bunch of stuff on their way to us. So using this profile, we can essentially tell how much stuff they've run into. One thing that really baffled astronomers is this amount of stuff that they have run into is more than can be provided by our galaxy, which means they're coming from galaxies other than our own. So not only are they bright, but they're bright from millions of light years away. When we first detected fast radio bursts, because it was so bright and so far away, the only thing we could imagine creating them was something extremely violent and cataclysmic. But we don't see things that are that bright in our own galaxy, so we don't know what's causing them. So a handful of years after we detected the first fast radio burst, my colleague here at the Dunlap Institute found something we weren't expecting at all. We found a fast radio burst source that was happening more than once. So that means that it can't have this origin that we were just expecting, this cataclysmic origin. It must be some source that can produce these over and over because we've seen hundreds of bursts from these repeating sources now. And it's not like some periodic thing where we expect to see one every few seconds but rather they happen sporadically. We have no idea when they're gonna go off. As random as these fast radio burst arrivals seem to be, they do kind of cluster together. That means that sometimes we don't see a fast radio burst for like a year from a particular source, and then all of a sudden we're gonna see 30 in 10 minutes. There's even one fast radio burst source that's repeating that we see randomly for four days, and then we don't see for another 12 days until it starts over again. So not really a periodicity, but these active windows are happening periodically. So far, astronomers have detected thousands of these bursts, and most of them we only have seen gone off, go off once so far. There are about 100 sources that repeat, so we've seen two or more bursts from the same source. And then so far, we've only confirmed one of these periodically active window repeaters. That's a good question because there are so many theories out there as to what this might be. We don't really know yet. Before the experiment that I work on turned on, there was this time where not only did we have more theories than we had actual fast radio bursts detected, but the rate at which we were detecting fast radio bursts was smaller than the rate at which we were making up new theories as to what might cause them. Thankfully, this amazing Canadian collaboration that I work on turned on, and now we don't have that problem anymore. There are lots of fast radio births detected. Of the theories that are published, most of them evoke connections to quite exotic species. So magnetars, which are really, really high magnetic field neutron stars, um, black holes, or even there's one paper out there by Prophet Harvard who believes that they might be aliens. The telescope that's proven most successful in detecting these anomalous bursts is called CHIME. CHIME stands for the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. It was originally planned to do 21 centimeter cosmology, that is the study of the early universe, but we ended up putting a fast radio burst back end that was really successful because it sees such a large portion of the sky. CHIME is located in Penticton, BC, so I'm gonna use Canadian terms when I describe the size to you. It looks like four super long snowboarding half pipes put beside each other. And the total area of Chime is about equivalent to five hockey rinks. Because we experience Canadian winters, the surface of the cylinders is made of mesh so that snow can just fall right through it. The computers that analyze the data from Chime in real time sit in these shipping containers next to the telescope. We then take the data from those shipping containers and we ship them off to collaborators at University of Toronto, McGill, University of British Columbia, and MIT, etc. The reason that we have to use these computers to go through the data in real time is because of that characteristic delay in time that I was talking about earlier. We don't know exactly how long that delay is going to be, and we have to test every delay. 
Because Chime observes in the radio band, we don't have to wait for the night sky. So we're looking at this huge patch of the sky all hours of the day, all hours of the night. The reason we have to do this in real time instead of just saving the data and looking at it later is because the data rate for Chime FRB is so high. If you were to save all of this data, it would be coming in at six terabytes per second. This is similar to all of the telecommunications for all of North America. 